Well, good morning. Thanks for tuning in and joining us at Frontline. Uh, we're gathering today as a church to celebrate and learn together. Uh, I just want to begin by just saying thanks for tuning in, especially if you made a decision last week to trust in Christ for the first time. We had many people let us know, and so we just want you to know we're celebrating with you, and we're excited that you're joining us again and taking a next step in your relationship with God. Uh, if you call Frontline Home, I want to let you know that you can continue to give during this time. If you haven't already made the transition onto online giving, the way you can do that is you can go to our website, frontlinegr.com forward slash give, or you can look on Facebook Live. There will be a note in the comments about that. But we would love for you to just continue to give during this time uh, when things are so difficult in our world. And I also just want to say thank you to those of you who have continued giving and who, are, who have been faithful in that way. Uh, before we worship this morning, I'd love if I could just offer a prayer and just focus our hearts on the person of Jesus. Would you join me? Father, we just come before you and we just ask you to focus us on who you are this morning. God, would you remind us of the ways that you are at work right now in our world, even in the midst of this time we find ourselves in? God, I just pray for those who are discouraged right now. I pray for those who are sick or who have loved ones who are sick. Uh, God, would you just be close to those? We just pray that your hand would just be on each person and each family as we walk through this time, this coronavirus crisis, God. We just pray for our leaders. We pray for our world. And we just pray for your healing hand to be at work. God, would you allow us just to be encouraged and to find hope in what is shared this morning through your word? And as we worship together, God, we just know that you are up to great things. You are still at work in this world, and we proclaim that you are still on your throne, and you still have a plan for us. So we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are my God, and you are in 
When the darkness falls, it won't grieve it. Cause the God I know knows only how to portray you. By God will never
ourselves wholly to you and we just thank you God for being the God who's always there no matter what God we are grateful for the time that we've had together to just worship and God as we hear from your word God uh, we just ask that you would anoint David as he brings your word anoint John as he brings your word anoint Brad as he brings your word we love you God in Jesus' mighty and powerful name we pray, amen. Well, once again, I just want to welcome you and thank you for joining us. It's so good to be able to worship together. And I want to let you know before David begins the teaching this morning, there's a couple ways you can get more involved even in this time when we're not able to gather together in the church building. Uh, one is you can get involved in groups by going to frontlinegr.com forward slash next, or you can access a list of the groups through the app. And we'd love for you in this time to just join in, take the next step and connect with others. That not only can be an encouragement, but it's also a way we can grow in our faith. Uh, another opportunity we want to let you know about is since this uh, time that we're living in um, has happened, we've started doing something on Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. on Facebook Live. It's a prayer gathering. So what we do is we actually allow everyone to, to write in and, and share prayer requests on a live environment. And then we pray together um, for our nation, for our world, for those who are sick. And it's a time of encouragement and it's a time of praying and going to God together in prayer. And so I wanna encourage you, if you haven't tuned into that yet, this Wednesday, we'll be doing that again, 8 p.m. on Facebook Live. And then uh, lastly, I wanna remind you again, you can continue to give during this time by going to frontlinegr.com forward slash give. And there's also a note in the comments of how to do that. Now let's listen and focus in to what God wants to say to us today.
Well, hey, good morning. Welcome. So good to have you joining with us on this live stream, whether you're at home by yourself or whether you're with your family or uh, whoever it is that you're with right now. We're just we're really grateful that you're able to join in with us in this live stream together right now. And uh, we do know we have a lot of visitors that are watching this, too, whether it's live or whether it's later. And so we just want to say welcome to you. We're really happy that you're here. My name is David. I'm on staff here at Frontline and with the Zero Collective. And I get to spend a little bit of time with you this morning, still tracking through the Gospel of Mark and what we've been working on. On since January. So I'm excited. Before we have that, though, before we jump into that, I do want to ask you a question. Uh, and the question is this, if you had to look back on the last four weeks, and if you had to, to name one word or give it one word or describe it in just one word, what would it be? What would that four-week experience be like? If you boiled it down to one thing, what, what would that experience be like for you? Go ahead and take just a second, whether it's just you and your journal or whoever else that you're watching with, go ahead and just share that with the person next to you. What, what is one word that could describe the last four weeks? Go ahead and view that. We'll be right back. So uh, I don't know about you, it took me a whole lot longer than 20 seconds to boil down the last four weeks into one word. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more it changed. And, you know, initially it's like, well, it's been full of change, you know, or it's been difficult or hard or unexpected or loss and stressful or fearful, whatever it is for you. But I've noticed that it's changed as the weeks have unfolded for me as well. Uh, but when I finally boiled it down and when I finally arrived at one word, the word that I chose to use was revealing. This last four weeks for me has really been revealing um, showing me what's really important in my life. You know, sometimes I think it's true that a lot of us don't realize how important things are until we don't have them anymore. A lot of times we don't realize how valuable things are that we're used to, whether that's our schedules, our ability to drive, or to be with people, or go into work, or have a job, whatever it may be. A lot of us don't realize or don't maybe even fully appreciate what we have until it's gone. But here's the other thing that's been revealing to me is uh, these new rhythms and new new pieces of my life that I've been able to put into practice, and, and this newfound time to spend with family, and my son Judah, and my wife Shannon. It's, uh, there's, there's definitely an other side of the whole four weeks here that has also been a gift. Uh, it's been a real blessing and a gift from God to be able to spend more time with family and more time focused on Him and reading and studying and praying. And so I hope it's been an experience for you, not, not just the loss. I think we all agree and we all feel the loss, but I hope you've also gained in the process. But here's the thing. This is one thing I love about Jesus and Jesus' ministry and his teaching, but oftentimes what Jesus does is Jesus flips things on their head so that whatever we once thought or whatever we once did or whatever we once expected, Jesus often has a way of flipping it and turning things around to present something new or to offer something new. And so it actually sets us up perfectly for the story that we're unpacking today. We're going to be in Mark chapter 11. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and grab your Bible. And if not, words are going to be on the screen. But in Mark chapter 11, it starts off with Jesus entering into Jerusalem. Jesus gets on the back of a donkey and rides into Jerusalem. And, and the setting, the timing is really important because it's Passover week. And so Passover week, it, I don't even think we have anything in our context or our culture that really symbolizes what Passover week was like. But Passover, everything I was reading, I mean, the ranges are ridiculous. Anywhere from a million uh, to all the way up to 2.7 million people would flock to the city at once. Every family would make their way to the temple, and there were different courts and different areas of the temple that only certain people could go into. There was a court of the Gentiles in which all non-Jews were allowed. Then beyond that, there was a court of women that only Jewish women could go into. Beyond that was a court of men, which was only allowed for Jewish men. And then beyond that would be a court for priests. I mean, so it, it was a tiered temple system, but the temple was so large. I mean, think about this. You have a million to 2.7 million people. The temple was so large, scholars estimate 
estimate that it could have held about 75,000 people at once. And so Jesus is making his way into Jerusalem and the people around him are excited. They're excited that he's here. They grab palm branches and they're laying their cloaks down as, as Jesus riding on the back of the donkey heading in. People are yelling, Hosanna, because they're excited because they think Jesus is the Messiah. They think Jesus is the one that the prophets had prophesied about that was going to restore Israel. But what that meant, or what that really meant, was different than what they expected. Something would be flipped in their minds that they would find out very shortly. And so Jesus enters in, and this is chapter 11, verse 11. It says this, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Jesus makes his way into the temple. Right? He, he rides in the donkey. His first stop is, let's go to the temple. He takes his ragtag group of disciples, a bunch of teenage boys and young 20s and an ex-tax collector and an ex-prostitute and, and this blind man, Bartimaeus. And, and so he, Jesus enters into the temple and it says he just, he looked around and then said, let's come back tomorrow. And he and his disciples leave. I, I have such a big, obvious question that's just blasting in my mind. And it says, what did Jesus see? What did Jesus see? What his disciples would have seen was normal. What his disciples would have seen was, this is chaos, man. This is just nuts. It's a crazy house here. I mean, just there's so many people coming in. There's millions of people, millions of sacrifices, millions of families that are coming in to offer sacrifices. There's an estimated over 250,000 lambs that would be sacrificed for the Lord during this one week of Passover. What the disciples would have seen is crazy, but normal. But Jesus saw something different. So much so that he left that night and came back the next day. Let's keep reading together. This is Mark chapter 11, verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. I love this this story. I mean, what we see is a different side of Jesus. What we see is a piece of Jesus that comes in and says, I'm going to flip things on people's heads in one of the busiest, most chaotic places where people are meant to encounter and worship God. But there was something wrong about the midst or around the temple that Jesus was observing that he said, I'm going to fix it and I'm going to fix it right now. Here's what he would have seen. This would have been normal uh, is the money exchangers. Everybody had to pay the same sort of temple tax. Uh, and so it, from people coming around from all different regions, people would have different currency. So they would need to exchange the currency so that they could pay only in the temple currency that was there. So there would be money changers, currency exchangers, really, that would exchange your dollar for a different dollar that fits the temple. And so that would happen. But of course, there's always a rate. Right? So there were people that started making money and, and making money off worship. People bringing an offering to worship, to give to God. Now there were others making money in the process of receiving that. There were also sacrifices that needed to be sold. So you needed to buy lambs, or if you were a poorer family, you needed to buy doves to be sacrificed. And so you, you wouldn't bring them with you. I mean, can you imagine not just bringing an animal, but your whole family and luggage and food and all of that? So, so they would buy the animal there, but as you can imagine, it would be more expensive than it would if you had just bought it in your hometown. So here's what happens. Normally, those things would take place outside the temple, but through the chaoticness, through the busyness, maybe even through the efficiency or comfort or convenience, the religious leaders allowed this sale or these processes that were happening to move inside the temple grounds into the court of the Gentiles. And Jesus saw it. Jesus did something about it. One of the other gospel writers said Jesus even grabbed a whip. 
he started walking in and, and he overturned tables. I mean, you can imagine money going everywhere and you hear the chinks of coins and, and the guys that were doing that are scrambling, trying to pick it up so that nobody else picks it up. And, you know, the animals, Jesus isn't letting anybody carry merchandise through the city. He's, he's pushing them out. He's saying, get outside the temple, get outside the walls. I'm stopping everything because worship was being impeded. And so Jesus started flipping things on its heads so that it could be restored to what God had originally required. Can you imagine being one of the disciples at this moment? <laughs> I mean, I, you just have to imagine like Peter or James just sitting there going, wow, <laughs> he just did that. I mean, it, it, you just, I can't imagine being one of them. That would just blow my mind. And, and you just go, I, I don't, whew. I don't want to see the high priest right now. I don't want to see the religious leaders right now. I, I can only imagine what they're going to say or what they're going to do or what they're going to accuse us of doing or Jesus of doing. I, I just can't imagine being one of the disciples right now. But a big question is this. Why, why was that so important for Jesus to remove this outside the temple? And it's actually found in the story that immediately precedes and follows what Jesus does in the temple. It says, when Jesus uh, was walking into Jerusalem with his disciples from Bethany, there was a tree that Jesus saw far off. It was a fig tree. We're going to put a picture of a fig tree up just so you could see it. They, they have big green leaves, and, and the fruit is like this big, maybe palm-sized or a little bit bigger fruit, and it was sweet, and it was tasty. And, and so Jesus, it says, Jesus was hungry, and so he saw the fig tree out in front of him. He saw it from a ways away and he could see that it was in leaf. The important thing to note is it wasn't the season for figs. It wasn't a season of harvest, but anytime a fig tree would produce leaves, it would also produce fruit. So Jesus sees this tree, right? Probably a big tree with green leaves on it. And he's hungry and he says, let's go get some fruit. I want to go see if this thing has fruit on it. So Jesus and his disciples, they walk up, and as they get closer and closer and closer to the tree, they realize the tree was in full leaf, but the tree had no fruit. Jesus looks at the tree, and he says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Jesus curses the tree. One of the gospel writers says it withered immediately. This one, Mark, what he says is the next day the disciples walked past it, and Peter noticed, and he said, Rabbi, the tree withered. It's visibly dead. And here, here's what Jesus was using this as an illustration for. It was immediately before and after what he was doing in the temple. Because the temple, what people would see, what the disciples saw, what, what everybody else, what you and I would have seen if we were in the temple was busyness and chaos. And it looks like worship and it looks like people are living out the religion that God had called or commanded them to do. And so what they see is, is the religion. They see a lot of leaves, but upon closer and inspection, what Jesus was really looking for was fruit. What Jesus was really looking for was prayer, worship, sacrifice, care for the poor, care for the needy, not manipulation and extortion. What Jesus saw was through a lens that was totally different than everybody else around him. And it moved him to action so that he started flipping what people knew, what was normal or what was expected or what this religion required. Jesus flipped it on its head. Jesus saw religion. He didn't see transformation. Here's the thing. I, I've struggled with this passage just leading up to this, and I, it's easy, I think, for us to look at the temple and Judaism and 2,000 years ago and to say that was them. But I, I have to ask the question, what would Jesus see if Jesus walked into our churches? What if he walked into our places of worship? You know, right now, nothing. You can't see anything, right? Because they're all shut down. Right? The lights are off. We don't have windows at Frontline, so you can walk around. You're not going to see anything. But, but four weeks ago or six weeks ago or six years ago, whatever it is, what, what would Jesus see? And chances are, I mean, he's going to see a lot. I, I wrote down some of them. Maybe what Jesus is going to see is this, people that are hungry for God and maybe people that are saturated in his word and people that are pleading in prayer and sacrificing and sharing all that they have. Maybe, maybe that's what Jesus would see. That's what I hope Jesus would see. That's what I hope he would see in me. I think there's a bigger reality, though, and a bigger truth that we need to unpack, and it's this. Maybe what Jesus would see is people who are hungry for their preferences. Maybe 
what Jesus would see is people that are looking for their conveniences, for their comforts. Maybe he would see people saturated in themselves, living a life of religion rather than transformation. What Jesus does in the temple is he goes to the things that are manipulating and changing and and distracting from the original purpose that God had created it for. What Jesus does is he flips them on their heads and calls them back to something greater. Jesus is far more interested in building disciples than he is big churches. And he's far more interested in transformation rather than religion. Uh, Our lead pastor... Brian Bloom and I, we were at a conference uh, about six weeks ago. It was kind of right before the virus kind of blew up in our country and, and became really real for a lot of us in our context. And, and I remember we were going to different breakout sessions, and the ones that he and I were most excited about and the ones that he and I spent the most time talking about uh, were about the Holy Spirit about how the Holy Spirit leads and how the Holy Spirit speaks and what the Holy Spirit is up to, not just in the American church, but in the worldwide global church. And so we were just attracted to these different sessions and what we were learning was illuminating a lot. And Brian asked me this question. I still remember it. I remember right where we were at. I was in the driver's seat. He was in the passenger seat. And he turned the question to me and he said, David, do you ever feel like we're building the wrong thing? He wasn't just talking about Frontline. He wasn't just talking about the Zero Collective. He was talking about the American church. He was saying, do you ever feel like we're, we're building the wrong thing? Not even just as leaders, but as people, as followers of Jesus. I, I really, it bothered me because as I started thinking about the early church, as I started thinking about the church that, you know, when, when the Holy Spirit showed up at Pentecost and filled the disciples with the Holy Spirit and they were speaking in tongues and there were flames on their heads and, and they, were, they start preaching and thousands start coming to Christ and it says they shared everything that they had and nobody had need around them. And, and in one day, only 3,000 people accepted the Lord, gave their lives to Him and, and what they met or where they met wasn't in large church buildings and large auditoriums with great worship sets and speakers and TVs and screens and computers. It wasn't that. It was people living and meeting in their homes with one another, studying together, worshiping together, and praying together on on a family level unit. That's where it was happening. That's what the church looked like. And it said it exploded and grew like wildfire. And so when Brian asked me this question, here was my response. Yeah, I think we're doing the right thing. I, I, I like the big church model. I like the, the attracting lots of different people. I like that we can create something that non-Christians or people that aren't believers are attracted to. I, I like this. I think it's convenient for people. I think it's an effective ministry model for our culture and our context. Here's what was really going on underneath me. I, didn't, I haven't even told Brian this yet. Here's what was really going on underneath me. I don't want to change our model because it's going to cost me everything. It's going to cost me relationships with people that I get to see on a regular basis. It's going to cost me what I love to do, which is speak and communicate to a group of people. Right now, this is totally different. There's one person in this room that's not me. What we're, what we're used to, what I was used to four weeks ago was a room full of hundreds of people that just, it's full of energy and joy and excitement. And what has happened now is it feels like utter loss for me. I didn't want to lose the comfort. I didn't want to lose the building. I didn't want to lose the production. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to lose any of it. And so out of that response to Brian, I, I tried to rationalize and I tried to justify, yeah, I think this is the model that works for us and I think it's fine. It didn't come out of a sense of obedience or a sense of, of purpose as a body and part of the body of Christ. Here's what it came out of, selfishness and a fear of loss. <laughs> and so I just can't help but think and laugh. Here we are six weeks later with all of that being stripped away. And I, I can't help but shake. We have more in common right now with the early church than we have ever had in our lifetimes and maybe ever will. It's a sobering reality, yet it's also a life-giving one. As I was thinking about this, I mean, just over the last couple of weeks, uh, how many things have actually been flipped on its head? 
right? I mean, so think about this. I grab this one. I, I love sports, right? Uh, thank goodness the Super Bowl was done. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> But March Madness, I remember the day March Madness was eliminated. At first they said, hey, we're going to play the games in stadiums with no people. And I went, perfect. I still get what I want. And then a couple of days later they say, actually, that's not happening. The whole tournament's canceled. And I went, wow, sports have been totally flipped on their heads. Maybe, maybe your work, maybe your job, this is a, a reflective vest, maybe your job has been changed. Maybe your job has been eliminated. Maybe your job has been postponed. Maybe whatever it is, your job has been flipped. Uh, here's another one. This is my checkbook. Um, I don't even think most people still have a checkbook, but I found one. Our ability to spend has changed. Do you realize that? I had no idea our government could control what we buy and don't buy, you know, to an extent. But, but I had no idea they could eliminate small household items for the sake of quarantining and keeping people in isolation. I had no idea that my spending could be flipped in the way that it was. What about media? I had no idea that our media would change, right? Live hosted, you know, audience filled uh, TV studios and whatnot. I mean, everything, media is changing. And here's the thing, maybe you're like, well, I still got Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime. Well, that's great, but there's gonna be a point if you haven't hit it already, because I know I have, that it's just getting boring. It's not doing for me what it used to do. I'm trying to fill this void with media that's just not going anywhere. My media has even been flipped. Here's another one, I, you gotta love this. My comfort has been flipped. Things like toilet paper that I never thought twice about in the past is now valuable to me. That things that I found comfort in, things that were normal to me, things that I had regular access to, I no longer do, and it's been flipped. Here's the last one. Well, two more. My ability to travel, my ability to be with people, my ability to go where I want to go, freedom, has been flipped, and then here's the last one, churches. Churches. Churches have been flipped. The way that we've done things has had to change. We can't gather, we can't be together, we can't be in the same room. Our children's ministry is affected, our student ministry is affected, our worship ministry is affected, our small groups are affected. Literally every function, every aspect of our church ministry has changed. It's been flipped. Here's a question that I just want to ask. I can't help but think about it. What if the coronavirus isn't the reason that all of this stuff is flipped? What if it's not our government or, or our governor or the White House that's causing the flippage? What, what if it's not um, the CDC or the World Health Organization? What, what if it's not the responsibility of the economy that everything is kind of turning out and, and falling into place the way that it is right now? What if they're not the reason that all of this is being stripped away? Here's a question that I've just been wrestling with. What if, what if God is behind the restrictions? I, I'm not saying God caused the virus. I, I think the virus, like so many other pieces of humanity that we live in, is part of the fall. When Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis, it brought a whole host of brokenness and sin and pain and death. I think the virus is just another strain of that. But, but what if God is behind the restrictions and the prevention and the flippingness that we're experiencing in our life? What if God is at work doing something new? something unexpected, something we didn't even know was possible. What if he's behind it? Would that change your response? Here's the, <laughs> let's keep reading and see the religious leader's response here. It says this in Mark chapter 11, verse 27. It says, they arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests and teachers of the law and the elders came to him, and they said, by what authority are you doing these things? Jesus replied, I'll ask you one question. Jesus is a mastermind. I love the way that he asks this because watch, he's going to trap the leaders who are trying to question, trying to fight, like even me, trying to justify what they were doing and why it was right. They ask this question, by what authority are you doing these things? And Jesus replied, I'll ask you one question. Answer me and I'll tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, John the Baptist, his baptism. Was it from heaven? or of human origin, you tell me. Here's what's significant about this. If you're not familiar with John the Baptist, uh, what John the Baptist preached was that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, the Chosen One. 
That's what John the Baptist preached. And so when Jesus asked the religious leaders, John's baptism, was it from heaven? Was it from God? Or was it just of human origin? What they were about to answer, if they said, yes, it was from heaven, then Jesus is going to say, then why didn't you believe him? Why didn't you believe him about what he said about me? If you would have believed him, and if you do say that his baptism is from God, then what he said about me is true, and my authority to do this is not from human origin, but from God himself. And so that answers their question. But here's, here's what they do. They, they talk together, and they say this. They said, uh, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? Busted. Right? That answers the question. His authority is from God. But if we say of human origin, it says, then they feared the people for everyone held that John really was a prophet. Here's the thing. They knew they were over a barrel. They knew they were in trouble because Jesus, if, if they said John's baptism is from God, then Jesus had the authority. And if they discredited John, which all the other people believed that John was from God, it, it was a gift from God and, and who paved the way for Jesus. If they say not, they will lose all of their authority and influence over the people. It was a catch-22 for the religious leaders. They, they couldn't answer either way, but deep down they knew. Jesus had just answered their question without saying the answer, and they knew it. So here's what they say. Here's how they respond. Uh, Together, we don't know. And Jesus says, then neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Can I tell you something right now? Jesus is building his church. Jesus isn't interested in, in building big church buildings. Jesus is interested in building big disciples. And I think a lot of us have been more married to the method rather than the mission. And so Jesus, as he was building his church right now in our world, I mean, here's some things to celebrate. Can I give you some news of hope and excitement? Uh, Last week alone, 23 people gave their life to the Lord in response to the Easter message that Brian preached. That's 23 people that gave their lives to the Lord and hundreds, if not thousands, all over the country, all over the world on Easter for pastors preaching and sharing the gospel and the good news. Thousands are coming to faith in Christ. There's people in our churches that are leading their own family members to Christ. This was crazy too. I don't know if you knew this. A week ago on Easter, Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham, went live on Fox News to the world and preached a message of hope in Jesus on Easter Sunday with the tents, the portable tents housing coronavirus patients in downtown New York City. And then he and his team went tent to tent to tent to tent, ministering to people who many of them are on their deathbed, fighting for their life, talking to them about the person of Jesus. There's public gatherings of prayer. There's public gatherings of worship. There's public gatherings of, of reading the word and studying scripture. There, there is so much happening in our world right now. Christians sharing what they have, being good neighbors, stewarding it all well. Jesus is building his church in an incredible way right now. The, the religion is dying and the church is rising. It's coming alive. We have an incredible opportunity right now as the church to lean into what Jesus is doing rather than trying to grasp for what we are losing. So here's a, the thing. I, I've heard this a couple of times just as I wrap up here. I've heard a number of times over the last couple of weeks, I just can't wait till we get back to normal. I can't wait till we get back to normal. I can't wait till we get back to normal. And there's so many of you on the other side of this camera sitting in your living rooms right now or sitting in your bedrooms or in your pajamas, whatever it is that are, that are watching this. Here's what you need to hear. I love you. I miss you incredibly. I miss you way more than I even thought I would. There's just this deep ache and this deep longing to be back together just as a body of believers again. I, I miss you. But here's the thing. I hope we don't go back to normal. I, I do hope we come back together and meet again. I, I do hope we don't have to worry about the threat of the virus. But I hope that this virus and the shutdown and what Jesus is doing right now, I hope this changes us forever. 
I think we lose if we fall back into old patterns and old systems and old religions and old ways of doing things. Jesus is doing something new. So how do we lean into that? How do we do what Jesus is calling us to do? I just want to read some scripture. James 1.27 says this, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Matthew 25.40, The king replied, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Philippians 2, verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And in this last one, let this just be our home base for no one. This is 1 Corinthians 3, 11, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. It can't be us. It can't be our preferences. It can't be our desires. It can't be our wants. The only foundation that will last forever is the foundation of Jesus and modeling our lives after his. I always worship before I get a chance to speak or preach. And there was a song I was listening to that the words just penetrated my heart as I was listening to it. And the, and the words go like this. They say, every breath I breathe, every step I take, I give it back to you. All that I am, all that I have, I surrender all. Can this just be our prayer today? That all that we are, all that we have, all that we want, all that we hope for, all that we dream of, all that we desire, that we can surrender it all at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, I want to be a part of your church the church that you're building, the church that is alive today. Let that be our prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now. I just pray for protection over every family, over every individual watching this broadcast right now. I just pray, Father, that you would just surround them with your love, that you would surround them with hope and with peace and with protection, and that you would remind them that you are God, that you are in control, that you love them, that you have a purpose and a plan and a calling for their lives to be a part of your church. And it means dying to ourselves so that Jesus might live through us. Father, help us this week to just pick up our cross, to carry carry our cross, dying to ourselves, and to follow you. Father, please do a work in us that's unlike ever before. Use us to reach our neighbors. Use us to reach our families. Use us to reach our neighborhoods and our communities and our governments. Allow us to come to your throne on our knees in prayer for the people around us rather than criticizing. Lord, we want to serve you. We want to honor you, and we want to give to you all that we are. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what a Savior has done.
thanks so much for joining us today on the live stream here at Frontline. Uh, it's just such a gift to be able to be with you in some way this morning. So thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you that are giving financially right now to help support the ministry here at Frontline, we just want to say a giant thank you. Uh, your investment in the community and in the kingdom through Frontline here is changing lives. And so we just wanted to thank you for every dollar you give. We are stewarding that as well as we can to make sure it gets into the hands of those that need it most right now. So thank you for doing that. If you would like to give today, you can do so just by visiting frontlinegr.com slash giving. Uh, one more invite that we have for you is if you're free on Wednesday nights at 8 p.m., uh, we would love to have you join us. We've been doing a collective-wide live prayer service together that has just been outstanding. It's been an awesome way for us to connect together as the church, to pray for those in our community and our churches and the world. So we'd love to have you join us on Wednesday and also next week Sunday for these services again. So thanks for joining. We love you and looking forward to seeing you then.